One week ago, the New York Mets left City Field with a 1-5 record, and they barely even got that one victory on the last game at home. Now they return after winning two straight series on the road, going 4-2, and two, with their last series coming against the Atlanta Braves. Is there finally some hope at City Field tonight? We'll break it all down on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. What a difference a week makes. The Mets go on the road, they win a series in Cincinnati, and then they head to Atlanta where we were all worried the Mets were going to go in there and lose four games because, remember, that was supposed to be a four-game set. They win game one, an emotional back-and-forth thrilling game where Brandon Nimmo just put the team on his back got them back in the game twice, and they just barely were able to hold on at the end. That was the game that won the series. Game two, they were in a hole, and they couldn't get all the way out of it, but they showed fight and resolve in that game. Then there was a rain out, and then we got to yesterday's game, or today as I'm recording this, um, and the Mets just completely destroyed the Atlanta Braves. Now, if you're looking for a game recap of that one, I was on a show with, Jake Mastriani, the host of Locked On Braves. We hopped on a live stream right after the game. So if you didn't catch that one, go back and you can find it. Uh, but throughout that episode, we talked about what was some lackadaisical play from the Braves throughout and how the Mets really were able to capitalize. And they played sharp and crisp all game long. Jose Quintana with a good start. The lineup just you know, adding on, inning after inning, they were fortunate at the end that Louis Guillaume coughed up some extra runs as he makes his first appearance in the big leagues outside of a Mets uniform in a Braves uniform pitching to the New York Mets. I'm sure he didn't expect that to be how he made his season debut. Uh, but here the Mets are now returning home, feeling so much better about themselves. And what I wanted to do to start the show is just go through the stats on this road trip because this lineup completely broke out in a massive way through the first six games of the season. The Mets scored 13 runs and they had 34 hits. That's an average of 2.17 runs per game and 5.67 hits per game. Now you look at what they did on the road. Okay. They averaged over 10 hits per game. They averaged 6.8 runs per game. I think it was 60, I uh, was 63 hits, 41 runs in those six games. If you remove the 16 run, 16 hit performance that was a little bit bloated on the stats on Thursday, the Mets averaged 9.4 hits per game as a team and five runs. Just a, a much better collective offensive performance. You look at the individuals. Brandon Nimmo had himself a fantastic road trip. He sat out that first game in Cincinnati over the last five, the two in Cincy and the three in Atlanta. He went nine for 22. He hit 409 a 480 on base of 864 slug. Now, a lot of that was going four for four in that first game of the series against the Braves where he had the two home runs. But still, monster, monster performance. He drove in 10 runs in five games, scored five. Just a great, great set of series, but particularly the series that he had in Atlanta. Just outstanding stuff from Brandon Nimmo. Then you go to Brett Beatty. His line kind of cracks me up. 370 average, 370 on base, 370 slug. That's what happens when you go 10 for 27 with all singles, but you'll take it. You'll take it. I mean, obviously you want Brett Beatty to slug a, a little bit, and I'm sure that will come. But look, if he's a 300 hitter this year without any slug and he's playing great defense at third base, I'll sign up for that without a doubt. So Beatty 
really is showing himself to be a stud over at third base. This is the guy that we were all so excited for last year. And I talked about it on the live stream after the game today, but it's worth mentioning again on this show. To me, the play that in a lot of ways defines Brett Beatty's season is the leaping catch that he made in this game where he, he's on his toes, makes an outstanding catch. Beatty is six foot four, I believe. He's a tall kid, jumps up, catches it, and he holds the, the his glove and the ball in his, his chest, in his like belly, and he's crouching down, and he's got the biggest smile on his face just staring at Francisco Lindor. He's having fun out there. He's confident. He's playing his game, and he has a really good game to play. So to see Brett Beatty do what he's done this season, I think it's probably been the best development so far because that was one of the biggest question marks. Yeah, Francisco Alvarez had a great first week, not so good this the second week here, uh, but we expected Alvarez to produce. Maybe not to the level of the first week, and then this week, you know, it was again the peaks and valleys. We'll see if he can stabilize his numbers a little bit. But we were we had high expectations for Alvarez. There's a lot of Mets fans who, before this season, were campaigning for Mark Vientos to take his spot and to be the starting third baseman when they saw the home runs in spring from Vientos. Beatty is showing why he won this job and why he might just start. Who knows? 155 plus games. I didn't expect that. I thought they would shield him against lefties, but he's swinging the bat so well and he's playing so well at third base. That's what you have to do moving forward. Just keep him out there, pencil him in every day. Kids obviously young enough to do it. So they should absolutely go with Beatty moving forward. Uh, Starling Marte played all six games on the road trip, hit 308, 379 on base, 308 slug. So not a lot of slug yet, but stole three bases. He's back in the two hole of the lineup. The Mets are going to 2022. We'll see how long they stick with this group. I'd imagine it could be the lineup they go with until they get JD Martinez back. Uh, because it, it, for one, was a group that won 101 games when you had uh, Nimmo to Marte to Lindor and Alonso. Starling Marte, the, the Carlos Mendoza referenced the fact that it, it allows him to run in front of Lindor and then Lindor can get base hits to drive him in. So, I like the lineup with Marte swinging like this. By all means, bat him second again. Jeff McNeil hit 300 on this road trip, 440 on base, 500 slug, had a home run, a double, led the team with six runs scored, four RBIs. So a much better second week of the season for McNeil. That was great to see. Uh, Harrison Bader hit 300 in five games played, uh, 333 on base. He scored five runs. Tyrone Taylor hit 375. Uh, 412 on base, 688 slug, had two doubles, and then he got a grand slam off Louis Guillaume. So the stats look bloated, particularly in a weak sample, but Taylor and Bader both playing well. DJ Stewart, a revelation in this series against the Braves. I was wrong. I own it when I'm wrong. Uh, you know, I did not like the at bats that I saw from DJ Stewart prior to this series. And even you know, that first home run he hit that was extremely clutch and it was a big, big, you know, reason they won that first game in Atlanta. It was a hanging slider. I wasn't still convinced because in that same game, we watched him, you know, take a fastball right down the middle and hit into a double play ball. So I still wasn't sold, but I'm a little bit more sold seeing this second home run that he hit on Sunday here. Or excuse me, not Sunday. It felt like a Sunday uh, on Thursday uh, because it, it was not just a, a clear hitters count. It was a one and one count. And it was a changeup that was low and out of the zone. And he got there and, and got a barrel to it and drove it out. It wasn't put on a tee as well as the first home run he hit was. But to now see him in the span of three games hit two home runs, he also walked you know four times on this road trip. So it was on base percentage, was 467. He's given them that's good at bats right now from that DH spot. And look, if you go back to last season in August and September, I was a DJ Stewart fan and I was campaigning for the Mets to keep him around and to get rid of Daniel Vogel back and you know, potentially give him this type of an opportunity. His bad spring and the rough first week had me concerned. Now I'm buying back in a little bit. I can see why the Mets are going to stick with Stewart and with Bader and Taylor playing well to go to that Marte Stewart DH platoon, letting Bader and Taylor both play against lefties. I'm cool with this line of moving forward. We'll see how they can keep this up. 
Uh, but again, just top to bottom, great production. Omar Narvaez, five for seven in his two starts, three RBIs, three runs scored. Really, the only holes in this lineup are the main guys. And so I want to talk about that in the, in the next segment a little bit. Pete Alonzo, Francisco Lindor, and Francisco Alvarez. They're the three that had a bad road trip. So I want to go through their numbers, and then we'll also carry that into our series preview, Mets vs. Royals. So we'll get to all of that in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Ibada. Spring is here, so it's out with the old, in with the new, but don't splurge on anything new without getting cash back in return when you use Ibada. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies and more. The average Ibotta user earns $256 a year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip. Other apps that give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, just add your offers in the app, upload your receipt, and you get real cash that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Join the over 50 million savers and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying by using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store, Google Play Store, and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back. Use that code LOCKEDONMLB. That's Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use the code locked on MLB. So while everybody else was having a great road trip, Pete Alonzo, Francisco Lindor, and Francisco Alvarez really struggled. Alonzo went four for 26. That's a 154 batting average. He had eight strikeouts and 26 at bats. Lindor went 148 for the average, 226 for the on base, 296 for the slug. Really struggled has struggled all year, and Francisco Alvarez hit 176, 222 on base, 235 slug. Now with Alvarez, he had a great first week, and they already said that he was a little bit banged up. That's why he ended up sitting an extra game. I'm not too concerned about Alvarez getting hot, particularly in front of the home crowd again. I'm okay with, with what we saw. He might be streaky. We might see that happen again, just like last year, but I'm hoping that the valleys aren't as long. So we'll see if he can get things back on track. Pete Alonzo. He started the road trip eight for 18 with seven strikeouts and one walk across the first four games. The last two games, he went four for eight with two walks, one strikeout, a home run. So it is turning for Pete Two multi-hit games to close out that series. Strikeouts went down significantly. Hopefully he can really have a big series. That's the thing is, you know, there is still going to be a series where Pete Alonso hits four home runs and, and can absolutely carry you to a, a series win, if not a series sweep. So that's going to happen at some point. The fact that it hasn't yet to me, it's, it's a good sign of things to come. I am not concerned about Pete Alonso hitting. I'm just not, he's going to figure it out. Francisco Lindor. Now, at some point, if this continues through this weekend, I'll have to do a deeper dive into the numbers to see exactly what's going on. What is clear to everyone, swinging left-handed, he is just lost. When he's you know, batting righty, he looks like Francisco Lindor. So he's got to iron that out. Now, throughout his career, he has always been traditionally better from the right side. But last year, you look at the splits, he was actually slightly better from the left side. It was really the same guy you know, at, at both sides of the dish. So. It's in there for him to be a good lefty as well as, of course, being a great right-handed hitter. He's just got to get comfortable. For whatever reason, it hasn't happened yet. The one positive note I can take from this past week, no strikeouts and 29 plate appearances. So at least he's hitting the ball. He's he's you know, identifying the right pitches to swing at. He's just not barreling things up yet. Hopefully, he can get his timing down this weekend and have that big series. Um, because you know, the fan base needs to see it from him again. Um, I, and I hope that, and I believe they will, the fans of the ballpark, I, I hope they really show up for him and, and cheer him on. Uh, just like they're, they're talking about doing the stand for Francisco Lindor. Uh, I think that could be really big to just, you know, try to ease the pressure heading into this series. Now let's talk Mets Royals though. So this is a Royals team that has won the last seven games in a row. 
They started their season and they lost their first two series. The first one at home to the Twins. Second one, they go on the road. They play the Orioles. They lose that one as well. They took a game in each of those series. So they were two and four to start the year. They return home. They get the White Sox. They destroy them in a four game series, sweep all those games. Then the Astros come to town. The Astros have not been the Astros this year, but it's still good baseball players. And the Royals swept them as well. So seven in a row, and you wonder how they've done it. Look no further than their pitching, okay? They have right now the second best rotation in baseball because the Red Sox are putting up ridiculous numbers that don't make sense to anybody. I'm buying the Royals starting rotation numbers a little bit more. It's Cole Reagan, Seth Lugo, Brady Singer, Michael Waka, Alec Marsh. Now, we'll talk about Reagan's Waka and Marsh because they're all going to be in this series. But just to start off with Seth Lugo, we all know him well. One, four, five ERA and three starts, two and oh, he's pitched 18 and two thirds in those three starts. Seth Lugo would be the ace of the Mets right now. It's crazy. Brady Singer has a 0.98 ERA and three starts. 18 strikeouts and 18 and a third. He has been great as well. The first guy the Mets will see, a former Met from 2020, Michael Waka, has a 2-2-5 ERA and two starts, 12 innings pitched, 13 strikeouts to just two walks. So that's what he's going to do. He's going to throw the ball in the strike zone, trust his defense, and he has been much improved the last couple of years since he left the Mets. So Waka's a, a tough draw. Alec Marsh, their number five starter, has a 3-0-9 ERA so far. In his first two starts, that's 11 and two-third innings pitched. Eight strikeouts to two walks. A guy the Mets can hit, though. I mean, he's had good starts, but you know, I, I believe you know, he went up against the Orioles. So that's a little bit surprising. And then the White Sox. The White Sox, you're a little less impressed with that one. So we'll see what the Mets can do there. And then they got Cole Reagans, who is the Orioles' ace for a reason. He's got 21 strikeouts and 17 and a third innings pitched so far. Has given up five runs, so he has a 2-6 OERA. But he is one of the most exciting left-handed pitchers in baseball. And he's got the final game of this series. So you kind of want to win those first two uh, because the Mets are going to be at a disadvantage whoever they decide to pitch in that final game. I will also note, though, that the Royals' bullpen is definitely an Achilles heel for this team that the Mets can exploit. They have a 3-6-9 in the ERA so far, which is middle of the pack. But their whip is the fifth worst in all of baseball. Of course, whip is walks and hits over innings pitch. They're giving up 1.56 base runners per inning is essentially what that means. So the, the traffic hasn't resulted in too, too many runs yet for them, but those floodgates can open. So if the Mets can hang in there and get to that bullpen in a tie game or a, a one run game, they can break some games open late. So that's really, I think a strategy here is trying to draw the pitch count up. The thing with this Royals rotation They've covered more innings than any team in baseball when it comes to their starting rotation. 78 innings pitch. They've only walked 19, so they don't walk guys from the rotation perspective. And they have a 196 ERA um, as, as a group. So a tough, tough draw to face this Royals team. The Mets will have Luis Severino in game one, Sean Manaya in game two. And then they originally had Hauser listed to start against the Pirates on Monday. They've now scratched that. It's TBD for Sunday and Monday. So we don't know if they're going to go to Hauser or Budo, but whoever it is, again, they're going to be at a significant disadvantage against Reagans. I hope it's Jose Budo. Lastly, to go over the lineup, Bobby Witt Jr. is a MVP candidate. He's got four home runs already. He's hitting 358. Uh, he's got a 755 slug and OPS over 1,000. He's going to really drive that lineup. MJ Melendez off to a great start as well. He's hitting 325, 426 on base, 675 slug. He's popped three home runs. Salvador Perez and Nelson Velasquez both are hitting over 320 with two home runs apiece. Salvador Perez has 10 RBIs. And Michael Garcia has an OPS in the 700s, but he has 12 RBIs. So he's driving in a lot of runs for them. So it's a lineup that is first in the American League in run scored and first in OPS. That happens when you go on a seven-game winning streak. But again, this is a dangerous Royals team that's heading into City Field. But I believe the Mets are measured to it. I think after going into Atlanta, having that emotional victory, uh, that's got to really carry over here. And I also think as much as you look at a team on a seven-game winning streak as a dangerous ball club, because of course they are, it's also a team that's due to lose. So I, I think there are some, some signs that I see 
that or or not some signs. I would say some storylines that I see that could play out this weekend that could lead to a really great series. And I want to talk about that a little bit, as well as the fact that on Sunday, Doc Gooden is getting his jersey retired. So we're going to go through what this weekend's going to mean to the Mets at City Field in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL and baseball's in full swing. That's why FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. You're going to get that $150 guaranteed. You can bet on everything from slap shots, home runs, to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Today's episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever. That's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, to drive revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That is linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on to get started. Now, I really believe this is setting up to be a great weekend for Mets baseball. There's the Doc Gooden jersey retirement. We'll get to that. But I think Friday night, it's going to be awesome to see Lindor get this ovation that people have been talking about on social media. It is totally a copycat of what the Phillies did last year with Trey Turner. I don't remember if that was organic. Like, I don't know if just everyone in the ballpark sort of knew and decided to give him the ovation or if that was a similar situation where the buzz started on social media and then it ended up making its way to the ballpark. But you know, once a, a large group starts standing, everyone's going to follow suit. And it's not to say, okay, he gets an ovation, he's Lindor again. But if Francisco Lindor in that moment, let's say Strong Marte got a base hit, he stole second, he's sitting there in scoring position. If Lindor can deliver and get a hit in that spot, that's going to take a lot of the pressure off him. And maybe it allows him to just start new. Like I said, he didn't strike out that entire road trip. So at least he's seeing the ball well. He's got to get that barrel out in front. He's got to be able to you know, catch up to velocity, to, to barrel these pitches up and to, to start doing some things. But I think that ovation can really maybe get him going a little bit. And who knows? And if the Mets can grab early momentum because of Lindor, that's just going to help them keep their own momentum that has carried over from that brave series. And I love seeing Severino get another start here. Uh, you know, his first two have been a mixed bag. Wasn't great the first time, second time, much better. I think this is a start where he puts it all together. We saw great stuff from him throughout spring and his fastball has that life and it has not hurt him this year. It's been the other you know pitches that change up and his slider in particular that have got hit hard. I think this will be the start where Severino really wows Mets fans. And if he can have one of those outings where he goes out and he strikes out eight and it gives them that six innings and people are, are, are getting that buzz going in the ballpark, I think that's going to bode well for him moving forward. And then you got Sean Manaya, who has thrown the ball as good as any Mets starter. I'm going game two. I'm looking at these first two games and all right, the Mets, they can end this Royals winning streak. They can win a series early. And then you just celebrate Dwight Gooden on Sunday. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a really exciting weekend. And look, the Royals, it's not a chief rival by any stretch. But personally, I hate the Royals because of 2015. I went to Kaufman a couple years ago uh, with my dad, and, and and we went to the, the Royals Hall of Fame that they had at the ballpark, and it was just filled with 2015 Royals memorabilia. It hurt being there. And I don't think any of this current Mets team feels that, but – the fan base, I would imagine, like myself, still does. So to have the Royals be the team that's in town this weekend for the Mets to reintroduce themselves to this home crowd, 
Uh, it, it has all the makings of a really competitive series, a fun one to watch, and one I hope the Mets can really get the edge on and, and take, and hopefully take early because, again, Sunday is going to be tough with Cole Reagans on the mound. But it will be in honor of a great starting pitcher throughout that game. That's Dwight Gooden. Uh, you know, I, I was there for Keith Hernandez's jersey retirement, and it probably when it comes to being in the ballpark, one of, if not the coolest experience I've ever had as a fan. Um, I'm trying to think back on past memories for me of other times um, that were that meaningful. I did go to some playoff games in 2003 when the Marlins were in the playoffs as a you know, local South Florida guy. And those were some cool moments as a kid, but again, it's a Marlins moment. It's not a Mets moment. Being there for, for Keith's jersey retirement, to see the outpouring of love he got from the fan base, it was awesome. And look, I if you go back and and – um, you listen to the show where the Doc and Daryl Jersey retirements were first announced. I, I was a little negative on it because I, I I believe that other jerseys that have been retired, these guys don't quite meet the standard that was set before them. Originally, it was an impossibly high standard. Get in the Hall of Fame as a Met, and your jersey will be retired. Tom Seaver, Mike Piazza. Um, but you know, then you go to Kuzman, who was such a big part of those early Mets teams and helped delivering a title. Keith Hernandez, the same thing. Obviously, Doc and Daryl did as well. But again, my initial reaction was just like, are they up to that standard? But then you look at Mets history and look, if Jerry Kuzman has his jersey retired, not to knock him, but just comparing his Mets career to Dwight Gooden's Mets career. I mean, Dwight's numbers are right there, if not better, pretty much all regards. He's second uh, best when it comes to wins and strikeouts behind Seaver. He's got the best winning percentage of a Mets starting pitcher ever. And it's still great to be able to honor anybody, particularly two guys that have you know turned their lives around who are so beloved by you know the fan base, uh, particularly those who are my dad's age. You know, the uh, those of you who were, you know, in your teenage years or a little bit older than that, my dad was in college or high school to college during the 80s. Um, you know, and so, so many Mets fans identify with those teams. I don't even you know personally, I, I was born nine years after the 86 Mets, but I grew up on the VHS tape of the Mets 1986 world team world series team. And I've read all the books. So, you know, I've even of course been kind of indoctrinated into 86 Mets. So getting a couple now ceremonies and I'm glad they separated them. It's cool that each of them gets their day. I think it's awesome, and and it's going to be a lot of fun um, throughout this weekend. I'm sure you'll see, of course, after the the ceremony, you know, he'll be on the radio broadcast and on the TV broadcast, and there'll be a lot of fun stories told. So it, it should be a, a great weekend for the Mets. And, and to close out the show, what I wanted to do, since number 16 will never be worn again, I figured it's only right to go through Mets history and – Tell you all the different guys that have worn the number 16 since Dwight Gooden. So we begin with Hideo Nomo. Four years later, 1998, the first to wear number 16 after Doc wore for one season. Derek Bell in 2000. David Cohn wore it. One of three jerseys he wore for the Mets, 44, 17, and then 16. Doug Mankiewicz in 2005. Probably my fir- my personal favorite, number 16, Paul LaDuca. 2006, 2007, the longest tenured number 16 after Dwight Gooden was Angel Pagan, 2008 through 2011, uh, Rob Johnson in 2012, Rick Ankiel in 2013, also in 2013, Daisuke Matsuzaka, he wore it again in 2014, Dilson Herrera and Danny Muno wore it in 2015, here's the worst one in my opinion, Alejandro De Aza, ugh, 2016. Austin Jackson and Kevin Kaczmarski. I don't even remember how to pronounce his name. That was 2018. Jake Marisnik in 2020. And then the final Met to wear the number 16 before it was retired was now Rangers great outfielder, or fourth outfielder, Travis Jankowski, the last guy to wear it. So now it'll go retired. It'll be up in the rafters and it will be a lot of fun to watch. As always, I appreciate all of you who tuned into today's show. Uh, if the Mets have a big game on Friday night, I am one 
to record a special Saturday edition of the show. So uh, if you don't want to miss that, make sure you follow, rate, review where we get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Try to make a push to 9,000 subs. So I appreciate all of you who subscribe. Uh, if you want to follow me on X, you can do so at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, you can find the link in the episode description. Uh, and now that you come to the end of the show, head over to Locked On Sports today for your second watch today, which is the first ever 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube that covers everything in the world of sports. The local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. Find Locked On Sports today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.